911, where's the emergency? Hi, it's not an emergency, it's a suspicious male. A suspicious man or male, like piece of mail, no, UPS? One single male. Uh, 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 a man? Man, one man. Okay, all right, ma'am, um, sir, and where, what is the address of the emergency or cross it's street? It's the corner of 164th uh -huh. Avenue and 80th. 7th Street, Howard Beach, 1141. Okay, so it's 164 Avenue, and what was the other street, sir? 87th uh, Street. 87th Street, and is he in front of a certain location or a building? No. Two months prior to the murder of Karina Ann Vetrano, Detective John Rousseau was off duty and spending the day with his daughter when he spotted Chanel Lewis walking around a predominantly Caucasian neighborhood. Perturbed, Rousseau dials emergency services to alert them of his presence. Just a day earlier to this call, Rousseau had spotted Lewis in the same area for the first time. Wary of him, Rousseau followed Lewis in his car for nearly an hour before deeming the situation safe. Okay, hold on one second. So on 164th and 87th Street, and this is in Queens, correct? And you said Howard Beach? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so, and there's a suspicious person just walking back and forth around the block? Yeah, he's looking in yards around different blocks, just by himself. Suspicious. Suspicious male, and just, um, what, what, he's wandering around the block? Yes, walking up and down the blocks with a hood on, and just uh, stopping in front of some houses, and he keeps going, then he stops. With a hoodie? What color is the hoodie? So he's got a black, black uh, track suit on with a white, uh, white and black top. On August 2nd, 2016, Karina Vetrano, 30, was last seen going on her last run in the Howard Beach neighborhood in Queens, New York City, five hours before she was sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Her father, Philip Vetrano, frantically looked for his daughter on the Spring Creek Park Trail. There, he found Karina's lifeless body laying face down in weeds, with her running shorts pulled partially down. The Vetrano murder case gained national coverage. For nearly six months, the NYPD searched for a suspect but came up empty-handed. Then, one day out of the blue, Detective Rousseau had a name. All right, Chanel, why don't we start with, uh, I think it was a Tuesday evening on August 2nd, um, 2016. Do you remember that, that date and that evening? Mm-hmm. All right. And where were you at that time? At uh, Gateway and Spring Creek Mall. Okay, by Gateway and Spring Creek Mall. Uh, Spring Creek Park. Park. Yeah. All right. Were you inside the park? Yeah. Okay. And was anyone with you, or were you by yourself? By myself. All right. About what time did you get to the park? About five o'clock. All right. And how did you enter the park? From what street? From you know where? Uh, oh yeah, Bell Parkway. From where, the, from where the Bell Parkway entrance is to the park? All right. Detective Rousseau and other New York City investigators were stumped. On Vetrano's body, phone and underneath her fingernails, unspecified DNA was found, but there was no suspect to match it to. Then, Detective Rousseau suddenly remembered Chanel Lewis's name and established him as a person of interest in the case. Officers report having visited Lewis at his residence in Queens, New York, where he voluntarily gave them a DNA sample. That sample matched the DNA found on Karina Vetrano. Now, while you were in the park, um, did something happen? Yes. What happened while you were in the park? While in the park, there was this girl jogging, and then, I, then I, you know, one thing led to another because of some other situation. During his trial, Lewis's attorneys moved for an insanity plea deal. It was obvious to everyone involved that Lewis suffered from an unspecified mental illness. The way he spoke, reacted, and carried himself was unlike any normal criminal. While being interviewed by the assistant district attorney Peter McCormick, it was blatantly evident that Lewis did not understand the gravity of the crimes that were being held against him. It appears as though Lewis's unspecified mental illness may have been that of one on the autism spectrum. Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, is a developmental disability that is caused by differences in the brain. While one's difficulties and struggles may vary based on where they are on the spectrum, those with autism typically experience problems with social communication or interaction, and are known to have restricted or repetitive behaviors. 
Lewis struggles and fumbles with his words, is unable to make eye contact, and is showing overall signs of discomfort or upsetness. These signs aren't uncommon when facing a murder charge, but Lewis's speech pattern suggests that he is overwhelmed and struggling. And uh, you said as, as she got next to you, when she got next to you as you as she was running and you were walking, what happened then? Because of a past situation, I got angry and then started hitting her and stuff like that. Okay. Um, before you did, where did you hit her? Like in the face and like in the mouth. In the face and the mouth. Mm -hmm. Before you hit her, did you grab her or did you just hit her right away? I well, kind of grabbed her first. Grabbed her? And like, how did you grab her? What part of her body did you, did you grab? I started hitting her because of the incident. Right, uh, but did you did you grab her before you started hitting her, or was the first thing you did was to hit her? What was the first thing you did? In 2018, Chanel Lewis arrived for his first trial for the murder of Karina Vetrano. The jury at the time was unable to reach a verdict, forcing the judge to declare a mistrial. Lewis remained imprisoned. During his second trial in 2019, an anonymous letter was sent to Lewis's attorneys, an unidentified whistleblower who claimed to be a member of the New York Police Department, stated that Detective Rousseau's story was a fabrication and racially profiled. For the first two weeks of the case, officers assigned to the case were instructed to search for two jacked-up white dudes. But on the 13th day, the letter states the investigation became radicalized. Forensic phenotyping is the science of prediction. Forensic analysts use DNA phenotyping to predict and narrow down possible suspect pools to aid police investigations in cases that have no known suspects. Forensic DNA phenotyping is only meant to be used for investigation purposes and not in the courtroom. With phenotyping, analysts are able to predict certain traits such as human pigmentation. The letter stated that on day 13, NYPD received data from the forensics team. The report showed that the DNA found at the crime scene belonged to a black male. Chief Boyce put out the order that all black men in both Brooklyn and Queens be swabbed for their DNA. Boyce also ordered that all black men who have been arrested in the area of Howard Beach whose DNA was not on file to be swabbed as well. The letter additionally states that Chief Boyce verbally made these orders as not to face any repercussions farther down the line. Over 300 black men were swabbed. Did she say anything at all? No. Did she scream? <coughs> no, because her tooth broke. I'm sorry? Her tooth broke? Right. Were you covering her mouth at all? No? Okay. How long would you say you were hitting her for? About how, how long in time? I mean, the whole thing was like about five minutes. Five minutes, all right. And did you do anything else to her besides hit her? Did you put her hands on any other part of her body? No. Okay, well, up around her neck or anything? Yeah, there was kind of situation. I'm sorry? Yeah. You put her hands on her neck? Around her neck? Okay. Many autistic persons struggle to handle conflict. In this situation, Chanel is briefly answering McCormick's questions. He's using one-liners, or very brief muttered responses, and this is prompting McCormick to ask again, clarify or rephrase. Chanel answered no when asked if he put his hands anywhere else on Vetrano, but when asked again, his answer and tone changes. Chanel's body language has become frigid and eerily still. His mind could be racing a hundred miles an hour, trying to make sense of his surroundings and calm himself down before he has a spell of wildly irrational behavior towards the assistant district attorney. Can you tell me about that anger? Because, you know, I used to live in a different address than I currently live right now. Right. And then there's sometimes there's this man that comes around there. He play like a lot of music and carry a lot of friends around there and then like it because I feel unsafe and comfortable and I like my place private right. and peaceful. And there was someone there who, who got you angry? Do you remember who that was? Mm -hmm. Do you remember who that was? Okay. Chanel leans back into his chair, visibly uncomfortable with the topic and struggling to find the right words. An autistic meltdown or shutdown is an intense response to an overwhelming situation. 
Meltdowns are not the only way an autistic person may express their emotions, but it is a more common occurrence. Others may withdraw from challenging situations altogether. Meltdowns or shutdowns can be caused by an array of triggers. Sensory differences, changes in routine, anxiety, and communication difficulties are all common triggers. In this case, Chanel is experiencing intense anxiety and communication difficulties with McCormick. He does not want to answer the DA's question because it upset him to speak about it. The anger McCormick is referring to may have been from a previous meltdown Chanel faced in the past. In 2019, Chanel Lewis was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole for the murder of Karina Vetrano. The Lewis family, friends, and supporters of Chanel Lewis have continued to fight for his innocence, despite his conviction. In 2021, Chanel's mother delivered a petition with 40,000 signatures to the Queen's District Attorney, Melinda Katz, demanding they send Chanel's case to the Queen's Conviction Integrity Unit and reopen the case. Despite Chanel admitting to the crime and traces of his DNA found on Vetrano's body, many believe that his confession was coerced and that the police racially profiled him. Chanel's attorneys also claim that his DNA, as well as hundreds of other swabs, were improperly collected and processed by an unpermitted lab contracted by the NYPD. Advocacy groups continue to rally for Chanel Lewis's release and for the case of Karina Vetrano to be reopened. Is Chanel Lewis the real killer? 